ATPI, delivering what really matters. Hi guys, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Speed Freaks Chat Show with myself, Scott Nichols, all brought to you by our title sponsors, ATPI Travel. Today's show is going to be a little bit different. We're going to take a behind-the-scenes look at what goes on on a race day, whether that's a Grand Prix or a domestic race, and how all those amazing images come to your screens. Help me give a bit more of an insight into that. I've got FIM race director Phil Morris and also Steve Saint, TV producer and director from Saint Media that produce all those shows. Thanks for joining us, guys. Pleasure to be aboard. Thank you for having us, Scott. Cheers, mate. I'm going to come to you first, Phil. Um, can you give us a bit of an insight on what your routine will be on the day of a Grand Prix? Yeah, the sort of routine when we get to a track, a lot of it is already laid. Foundations are laid within the winter. We write an extensive, probably 100-page work manual, which is given to every organiser, what they should do, how they should do it. So the feel should be the same whether you're in... Cardiff or on the moon, it should look similar apart from the stadiums. So yeah, when we get to the the track at the Grand Prix, it's a case of um, having extensive meetings with the organisers and the clerk of the course to make sure everything's in place. So sort of going through track safety, pit safety, that mine's sport inside. I have nothing to do with tickets, with advertising. I'm more the sport side only. So it's just a case of uh, going through everything making sure everything's in place, make sure everything's safe for the riders. And uh, yeah, that's the main thing before. Does that role fall onto you though? So the safety, so when you say about, I presume you're going to check the air fences and the safety fence, all those aspects, is that fall solely on your shoulders or do you have other people in the team that help with that? Yes. Well, sort of I'm the person on the ground that would have to pick something up. So when I get there, the first day I get there, I'm on my own. So I literally walk around the stadium, checking everything and, uh, you know, small things like the the clips on the air fences are broken. You know, they, they'll have to get fixed. And I let the clubs know then sort of on the Wednesday so they've got a few days to get the work done or any of the other FIM officials and riders and mechanics arrive. And then once we get to that infamous 6 o'clock UK time, 7 o'clock European time, when the cameras then start to roll, how does your role then change? Yeah, well, we got the riders briefing just before that at 5.45, which is sort of that one every time and we get that out of the way it's just only with the riders so we have 15 20 minutes chatting about what's different a lot of it's the same but who we'll maybe have will have an alcohol test things like that so that gets done at six o'clock but then at six you sort of um and steve will understand this we've all already had a production meeting which and i think you've been in some scott you've seen them it's down to the second and not just a minute and so, yeah, my, my job then is to sort of prepare ready, make sure the track's in good condition and as it needs to be. And then the riders get ready around about quarter to seven. And then they go on the parade and that's on Steve's, you know, as a producer, his call. And then he does the start of his show then at uh, seven o'clock. OK, so then then that hands over to Steve. So, so Steve, uh, you've been kind enough to get some footage from a domestic race here in the UK that kind of shows a little bit more of what's going on inside the race truck. So. Um, if you can just that will come up now if you can just elaborate on that a little bit as to what's actually going on in that truck and who's communicating to who etc right in the in the truck basically what you'll end up is with a, a tv director who then he's switching in and moving the cameras around as to what you see into the angles you get a producer who obviously oversees the overall running and along with a pa uh, who then does the countdown um, and you will then obviously have graphics guys as well in the back and all of those voices intermix with one another to try and bring you the the action as as it happens and unfolds um, mainly the director's role is to uh, direct each cameraman where you're going following the action and that's whether that's on the track or it's off the track and then obviously into the pits and obviously to wide shots as well, when we want to put TV graphics up, et cetera, et cetera. The role of the producer is to make sure the, uh, the overarching look and feel of the show and the editorial role uh, is, is looked after and, and taken with. 
So that's his role. So between the director and the producer, you actually get the, pretty much the finished product. And with the PA who often sits next to the um, director, it's their job to make sure that all the um, commercial breaks and the programs go on air on correctly. Uh, she's, in, she's the main person speaking to transmission, which is what you see in front of the television, as to why we can go to the breaks cleanly and come back cleanly. Um, and she will then obviously take us off 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 the show as well. And uh, and in this instance, you've got a graphics guy in the background as well. He's uh, obviously under the direction of the um, director, and he will be adding in the graphics as and when from um, the race results right through to interviews, etc. Uh, from um, etc. Basically, yeah. So then the, the person on the ground. Uh, so you're presenter or whatever so abby stevens in the case in in the uk she'll be having all that directed into her ears as well won't she yeah well this is it scott and you'll know that from experience from being in the bt studio at uh, premiership one of the things uh, um one of the great things about presenters and and it's not really known is that the amount of uh, noise in their ears the amount of people that are talking into their ears and uh it that is being directed by where cameras are going whether she's talking to a camera or she's she's out of vision the producer saying where we're going next or what vt is coming in and linking in and she might also have to um be doing hearing all this as she is interviewing someone but anyway uh, a little less for me let's just get an impression as to say what um we caught up with abby anyway and gave you guys an idea of what's going on Thanks, Steve. So the voices in your ear, I'm not going to lie. At first, it is a huge minefield to navigate. I can remember I used to go to sleep in the early days, literally those voices still in my head, particularly someone counting, because there's always someone counting you off air, on air to a commercial break. And in motorsport and speedway in particular, it can be doubly chaotic because you've got the sound of the methanol engines in the background. You might be interviewing a rider and the director and producer speak in your ear. You're trying to listen out to the rider um, so that you've got a brilliant follow-up question. So yes, what I suppose is slightly overwhelming at first then does become a huge support because all those voices in the gallery are there to guide you and the program so if you can just listen out you learn to do this listen out to what's for you let go of the stuff that's not and that's why it does help to work with a regular team because certain people have certain intonations passion that comes through in in volume so you can yeah just dial up those little nuggets of gold that are for you and dial down the, the other stuff so yes crazy at first and then hugely supportive once you get used to it pretty intense abby's a professional um like you said we know it's exceptionally difficult so what will you then be relaying to phil what is the communication between you guys okay um with the grand prix series um very similar things happen with the grand prix in race terms and television terms as what we do with the premiership for example where abby's involved the main difference with myself uh, at the uh, Grand Prix is I don't have a presenter working with me, but I still have to have someone coordinating the week, um, the, the race meeting and understanding what television's following. And that's really, believe it or not, is where Phil comes in because our relationship is about timing. And from the perspective, as Phil alluded earlier, of pushing the, the, the riders off at certain times. So for example, um, all the preparation before we go to an event is done at the event. Um, it's, it's done before the event. So we know the timings. We know we've uh, all broadcasters are told what time we will go on air, what time the parade will be. And the good thing about the Grand Prix is, as Phil has alluded, it's pretty much structured. So everyone knows what they're expecting to get. So, for example, uh, 1847 is always a number in my mind because we know that's what time the parade pushes out. We know roughly how long that parade should take, subject to the size of the stadium, et cetera. And, and Phil and I are always often discuss, well, we, you know, time the national anthem's done, um, we'll have about two or three minutes before I run the main titles at uh, what effectively is six o'clock, what you see in the UK or seven o'clock. And we do four minutes of that. Often enough, BT will be listening to me and they might avoid that. Uh, they might take the parade, but they will avoid the um, uh, uh, opening titles and things because they're already on air. They don't need to do this. But the key next thing will be the four minute past seven push off. 
So I create an opening which in, uh, introduces the, the current championship positions, what happened at the last race, etc. But Phil won't release those guys until we go, Phil, release them at four minutes past. And if we've got a technical or there's a bit of an issue, and likewise, if Phil's got a problem in the pits and we're going to delay to the start, I'd say to seven minutes past, I can inform the broadcasters, look, we won't see their bikes pushing off till seven minutes past. And this type of dialogue goes on throughout the whole race meeting. So, for example, we go out and heat one and we crash. Now, I will not, for example, some people go, oh, let's see a replay, let's see a replay. I won't um, do a replay on the world feed until I know the rider's safe yeah. and the rider's happy. Yeah. And that's where Phil comes in as well. Because until Phil tells us the rider's okay and we're all going to be fine, we move on. And then we get to the end of the heat, it's all rerun. And, um, and we get to something like uh, heat four. Um, and then we will have... The world needs to take a commercial break. It's a grading break. So here, give me an indication once I've gone through, or we'll be about seven minutes for the grading break. Or if a track needs more time, then I can relate that back. We never become very um, precious on time, although yeah. we have time scales to run to. But it, the most important thing is that we get the, 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 the stadium right, everything's right for the riders, um, and television sort of follows. And it's that combination of all the time of following. And that's how basically how it all runs through the night, right up until the final podium presentation as well, because um, we have to give options for um, TV companies just to dive out at, at certain times. As we know from Speedway, the yeah, only yeah. time frame that's exact will be the seven o'clock start, the four minute push off. And after that, anything can happen. But it's the communication with Phil and I that as we go along in the evening that keeps the whole thing on course and, and he can also speed it up a bit for me and say i'm going to speed it up this is going to be a shorter break grading break we or we're not going to regrade uh, and and things like that so that's what i keep communicating to the broadcasters but also the thing is is that the one thing that a lot of people probably don't appreciate is that you're not just doing this for bt or eurosport whoever it is this is going out to all the other different yes. well it's, like you said world feed a lot of people don't understand what world feed is so how many other networks are you on a given night oh, going out to? We could be 20, 30 broadcasters around the world. And they are actually following, basically, they hear what I'm saying. The same hymn sheet. With regards, yeah. And, and, and just to explain, a world feed basically is the basics feed of graphics and the action and everything else. And what you get then is you plug in to people like uh, BT, plug into that signal from the satellite. And they, by listening with the communication of myself and knowing that Phil's on the ground telling me that's how it's going. They will be able to take their commercial breaks. They will be able to take their studio time and they'll be able to cue in correctly you to stop talking, for example, um, at BT and in time to match with the commentators as well, coming back in at the correct time. So it's all about communication as much as delivering all the vision. And as you say, Phil's a large part of that on the ground. He's the only person who can tell me what really is going on. So Phil, and, and that's important because, like, when we have a, a heavy rain downpour, maybe up more than that, I use that because we always seen it. You know, the TV guys need to know how long it's going to be till heat one. Now, this is where, you know, Scott, it's not an easy task. When I'm looking at tractors, I'm saying mm, it's going to be at least a half an hour. And at some point, I've actually gone twenty minutes in. I'm thinking, it's quick, can we go five minutes earlier? So I'm speaking to Steve and saying, can we go a bit earlier? Are you okay with that? Again. Going back to the start, we're all linked with satellite watches. So it's to the second when I send the riders off. And again, as soon as heat four is finished, the first thing I'll do, I'll look at my stopwatch and I'll say, I don't know, 1942, we will push off. So I'll give him, a, and unless that changes, Steve knows then, I guess, what to tell people where the great uh, breaks are going to be. And that goes on through the night. And like I say, I don't know what Steve thought, but watching the uh, UEFA, showing uh christian erickson again he spoke about what we do in speedway that we wouldn't show uh a replay if somebody you know if someone's broken a leg or an arm that's not life threatening but i know if i go there and somebody's knocked out or they're in a bad way we're not going to show that interview we're going to be respectful and going back i don't know what you thought see but i thought it was pretty bad that they showed all the way through you know in being you know shocked and being you know pumped and everything I, I have to agree with you. Um, if I'd been directing that feed, you would not have seen 
the the chaos and everything that was surrounded and everyone said and I know it's quite interesting because I picked up on some people saying oh it's so good we really understand but realistically thankfully the man went on and he's making a recovery but there is no way no way in God's earth would I ever and I haven't done uh you could see for frustrations and people go oh we'd like to see the crash and I've got referees on Phil's case yeah, yeah. saying well, I want to see a replay I want to see a play and I've just turned around and said I am not seeing anything until Phil or my floor manager tells me that guy is up or he's he's compass mentis because it just simply don't and and I've been doing this sport and I've not missed the Grand Prix since 2002 and to this very day I've not shown anything because it's my big even when I'm working with multi-language um OB trucks and directors and things like that it's a complete no don't so go there go away people's yeah. family and friends at home you know exactly and that's the thing and I think it's good that you showed our respect I mean when I've been in the studio, we know when there's not a replay, we know that it's because it's, an, it's a serious accident and, and you give them that time. And again, that's an awful lot of pressure on you, Phil. You're making those calls. And 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 I think hopefully people get an understanding of, obviously we do see you on camera at times and we can hear you shouting away sometimes, but you've got that pressure in your ear that you've got yeah. to hit those marks and people don't understand that. And at the same time, I know as a rider's point of view, that if your bike is not quite ready and the mechanics and and you know the bad language that goes on, and you're going, come on, we need you out, we need you out. And the mechanics are like, I'm yeah. not ready. It's a world champ. It's it's real, it's a massive pressure cooker situation. I try and respect the riders as much as I can, Scott. And I'll look if I know, because I know what the bike's what they're doing, if they've just got to take the primary chain guard off and give it a bit of a knock or maybe change the chain, I can do it. If I see them trying to change a set of handlebars or, you know. Maybe yeah. a front wheel is okay. But there's a certain element where I would say, guys, this is not going to, you're not going to get this done in time. You're going to have to get the spare bike. So yeah. I inform them. And again, this is talk, working with Steve on that. You know, how long are we going to be? Because maybe you want to go to the studio. Is it going to be, so I'm going to be like another two minutes and then we'll have the two minutes. So I'm feeling where we are all the way along the event. So when you have an incident like that, or there's accidents, then you've sometimes got time to make up or you've got time to feel. So do you have a backup strategy in place for that or do you literally just have to kind of adapt in that moment um well the thing is scott i've got i'm i allowed for two inter interesting scenarios when i'm actually looking after or we're looking after as a team with the premiership then obviously we're not developing what we call a world feed so we then have opportunities to go away from interviews and we do this that and the other or we'll play a bit of et or we reanalyze stuff and that what with the world feed with the grand prix for example you can't just go off and make it up as you go along and all i can do is say if there's going to be a major delay suggestion is let's get back uh, you know there's going to be a major delay and all you can do is wide shots and and pick up on a few things and occasionally you might just drop down for an interview but you you've just got to keep telling to broadcasters where you're going so if we have a major thing like for example an airbag uh, burst class. we know yes. that's going to be a 10 minute yeah yes we know there's a 10 minute you know a, an air fence and stuff like that you often say, look, this is an air fence, guys. It's going to be at least 10 minutes. And I can't do nothing other than just keep moving the feed around and keeping Nigel and Kelvin talking, et cetera, et cetera. But I will give them a pause to stop, allow, for example, then everyone, let's quickly return back to the studio with you guys. And then I'll keep them talking. And then Phil will go, I think we've got about another two minutes, Steve. And then I will be informing uh, the gallery, say, for example, at BT, we've got two more minutes. And I will pause the guys at a certain point. The same way as I would pause them ahead of every graphic that we come in after a, a break and every uh, table after a break so that uh, people can come in and out. But you just have to really go, go along with, with your instinct. Grand Prix, believe it or not, is easier simply because I'm doing this, what I call this world feed. So I don't have to worry about studios and things. Whereas in premiership terms, when we are working obviously closely with our new partner at Eurosport, we then have to make it, keep it moving, keep it filling, and and Abby needs to intervene, or or, or Brando, or someone to come along and do an interview, or etc. So so they, they, there are different you know little things, but you always have something up your sleeve, and you're always yeah. preparing, and and you're always watching the watch, and that's that's part of the job, you know. And you were saying um, sometimes when you do the OB trucks, I know in particular when you go to Poland, there's a language barrier. Does that throw up a massive curveball, and also? I can't remember which one it was. I remember there was a time where all the sound went and I can hear you having a nightmare in a truck because, you know, the sound drops or the internet drops. And, and, and in our ears, we're going, we've lost everything. We can't hear anything. So we're sitting in the studio going, 
We don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I think I think to be honest, it was back to last year. I can't remember. I think it was World Cup or something. We or no, no, we, we'd lost something with the commentators, and and suddenly everybody had to. Maybe it was a couple of years ago. By the end, we had some issues a few years. Yeah, and we just sort of, you know, sometimes it just drops out. Interesting enough, most of the time we're on our own independent power. I mean, we've had examples where where the lights have gone out um, and we're still on air and and, and things like that. But no, you you just have to adapt. There's nothing you can do. Um, You just have to inform, um, you know, broadcasters what's happening and and keeping you guys, you know, um, in tune with, with everything we're trying to do. And that would be the only time that Steve would come to me to say, look, Phil, we have a serious problem. I remember in Voyens, can you hold yes. it at the moment? And that's the yeah. only time in six years that Steve's ever asked me because obviously it's a little bit different to the British Speedway where I'm not dictated to by the TV at all. I do my show and the TV works with it. Where I think, like you say, because you're making a full show, it's a bit more organised differently. But that was the only time, I think, Steve's ever said to me, look, just hold up. We've got nothing going to the world at the moment. We need to just hold a little bit. So we did. Yeah, I remember that because um, the truck power went bang. Very, 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 very unusual. And you can't let it go on and then just the world come back and pick it all up. And it was easier just to literally run out the truck. Ten minutes. Bill, stop, stop the meeting. Can you just give us, um, we've got the power back. And literally seconds it went. And um, it's very unusual, as I said. So, Instead of like, oh my god, what do we do? Because we can't record the the, um, the the racing as because we had nothing. So that's gone for posterity. So you're better off in, with the communication we got saying the boys. And and that's what I love about our sport is that, it, that everybody's such a family and everyone works together. That if Phil runs out and says, guys, we've got a technical problem with the TV, it's happened this once, and just go, can we just hold it there? And then I'll come back out and say we're back up and running. I think we were delayed by about ten minutes, Phil. Yeah. I think. And we missed, I think, the last two laps of, of, of that particular heat. Um, but then we can just re, reset up and rebuild because also transmission needs to come back as well. Because once we are the, the pictures, there's no other backups. There's nothing. So if you lose a transmission, and I actually, it's funny, Phil, um, I was having the same conversation last two weeks ago. I had a very similar situation in Sardinia with the World Rally Championship. It just went bang. No, not gone for years and years, and it just seemed to go. Just one of these things. And um, again, you know, we couldn't recover anything. Um, we just had to bring it all to a stop. So, yes, fingers crossed. And, and you do put backups. We've got generators and double generators. But there's always something that's, you know, yeah, nothing's absolutely And down. I suppose, like Phil said at the beginning, where, you know, everything is scripted and, and planned before. So I suppose when you've got, you know, in an OB truck where there's a, a language barrier, I suppose, yeah. that's where it's really important that those people have had their job description and they know their job and and kind of, do they kind of just almost get on with it themselves? You don't really have to say well, too much because they know the script? Yeah, well, to a point, um, I'm very lucky in that the guys we've used over throughout Europe, um, we don't take British, lots of British people. I, I've, I've been very fortunate in that um, with the Polish, with the Swedish guys, um in the past with the guys even in slovenia um there's been a, a good director with a, a decent language basic language and a knowledge of speedway and there's an awful lot of pointing going on and wides and and tights and and things over the years and people have got to learn to how i've tried editorially saying i want to go there and want to go there the beautiful thing is you've got lots of monitors in front of you so if all else fails you can just literally point i want to go there but because it's also structured and we know that we're going to go X amount of heats and it's a grading break, X amount of heats and a grading break, and then this is going to happen at the end, it does sort of run that way smoothly. It's just the language problems come when you get you people in the truck or certain replays aren't played how you want them to, or the poles, they sometimes start pointing in areas you don't really feel suitable and obviously getting off crashes as well and not playing in the, you know. So, but over the years, I've had pretty much the same group of people, as I say, whether Sweden, Poland, um, Slovenia, Germany, uh, that they, they, they've all traveled around, even to Russia. Russia was a challenge and it will be again this year, but that because they're not so used, they're used to ice speedway instead of normal speedway. But generally speaking, the language barrier over the years um hasn't been too much of a problem. Hasn't too much because we learned to work together through the the, the use of sign and pointing 
and certain things yeah. uh, and a couple of and a couple of like i think i've learned a couple of last laps in polish and so yeah. when um when it comes to you saying about the replays I mean, so that's all in the race truck so before we get to that stage obviously you know they'll they'll have to do a recce of the stadium for the camera positions and obviously you've got the safety issues logistics yeah. you've got all the trucks that need to come in so how involved are you guys with that and is that does that ever rule stadiums out because it's just not possible as we speak, they've got to be good for the FIM and they've got to be good for TV. So sometimes we'd be like, oh, where do you want your camera, Steve? And, you know, where's the podium going? All these things you don't even consider, but they're all part of, believe it or not, last year with COVID, uh, BSI come to sort of me and Steve, what, what should we do? And me and Steve stand there and we sort of come up with uh, what we're going to do with a draw because we couldn't do it the other way. So we are sort of on the floor quite a lot doing things that are sort of sometimes a little bit different. And Going back one quickly was Lublin for the Speedway Nations last year. The track was wet already. Heat one started and the rain came down. And I just said to Steve, we've got to push. We can't go to a break. Is it okay after four to keep going? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Got the heat eight. Steve, I need to keep going. I can't stop. Yeah, okay. Got the heat 12. So where you're normally structured, suddenly I'm the one saying we can't stop. So this is hard then for him to explain to the world that we're not taking no commercial break. So everything is all. Like I say, it could change like that. But before the event, there's a lot of things that goes on. And Steve's obviously does his cameras, but there's certain ones I would get involved, like the flames on the, the finish. I can say, look, they can't be too close, so they have to be there. And that's all linked into where Steve would put his cameras. Yeah, that's it. So there's an awful lot involved. That this is what this is what's great about this feature is that there's so much goes on behind the scenes that the, your general public won't know about. They'll just They'll see the images pop up in their screen and go, oh, man, that was a brilliant replay or that was really good. But they just don't realise how much goes into it and, and how much you have to look into and with all the positions and, and the communication. I think it's great. Well, there's a lot of preparation, as Phil's already said, before we go. Everybody knows pretty much where their camera positioning and, and everything else is. The only difference is, is when we do, as Phil pointed out, we, we do go to different tracks. And the, the big issue is, is you... <laughs> With the sport, especially up until we had we went to timing, the the, the, the crucial camera over the line to for, because that was actually the only defining moment with some of these referees to, to to call a race. And sometimes when you go to certain tracks, you know, they built the stadium for the referee. They didn't think about the television. Gorzhov's a, a good example where we have an offset uh, uh, for that camera. A couple of the Italians never, we never had a really direct camera. We're having to be slightly side, off to the side. And there's compromises like we can't put that camera there because we need a bigger platform. Well, that's in front of our VIPs or our lovely turn one fans. And so you're constantly looking at in that and safety at the same time and the pits. And, 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 and obviously, you know, some, some stadiums, you know, you go to somewhere like Bellevue and Manchester, it's, it's like, a, it's beautiful, you know, it's all clean and that. And then other stadiums, in fairness, you do go to and you think, oh, God, this, this is the world championship. We, we yeah. want to keep it all clean and look. And to be fair to BSI, we have a, a, a whole combination of things that where we're trying to make it look as clean and as neat as possible. So because it looks like a world professional championship as, as it should be seen across the television. But it's, it is quite interesting what, as Phil said, picking up on the it, it's it's all the groundwork that's done before you're then doing it. When you get on there and you're going, okay, 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 a couple of tweaks. And actually, to be fair, the, the icing on the cake is the racing. It, it, it's it, you know you, you you've set the you've set out the groundwork. You've, you've you've done all the base, you know, all the base things, and and, and it's just then hopefully the the meeting then can go ahead and and run as smoothly as as we we've all planned. So you, you mentioned, mentioned referees just then. Sorry, Phil, because you've mentioned referees, um, and we know obviously it's become very apparent about the timings and how crucial they are. You must have been in situations then where you're under mass, you're putting the referee under pressure because I know sometimes you sit in the studio and the referee has taken forever to make a decision, but you've still got your markers to hit. So are you sometimes in a position where you've got to get the ref to kind of speed no. up a little bit? The no. ref takes as long as he wants. I don't push the race off till he's made the decision. No. In the past, it could have been a two, three minute, and that three minute feels like forever. But now we've got yeah. the time in. It does make it a lot easier for the referees and... Uh, but again, all these things, like I've got the referee in my ear and I've also got communications with Steve. So I, I'm in a similar boat where my prime objective is making sure the ref is aware. And when a ref gives me a warning, 
sometimes Steve or guys will ask me, who's had the warning? We need to know. We didn't hear it properly. So it's about linking things all together. And, and you know, it's, it's easy to think it works like clockwork, but it does. But you look at someone like BSI, who's not been spoke about, their job is up to heat one. Once heat one is started, BSI is sort of done for the day. They are, all their work is in the pre-event, weeks before, months before. And so they're a big hog of the wheel. But like I say, it's where me and Steve start, they sort of finish in a sense. Once the racing starts, BSI relax, where me and Steve go to work. Mm. Yeah, very yeah. much so. Very much so until that champagne's popped. And yeah. then <laughs> I can roll, the, roll the highlights. And then I'm feeling, oh, yeah, hopefully that's a good job done. Yeah, definitely. And then then it's time to relax. So um, do you know what? It's been been fantastic. Thank you very much for, for joining me and giving me an insight into that. Um, I hope you guys have watched, have got much more appreciation for them. Don't you feel such a hard time because now you know he's got such a tougher role to do. Uh, thanks ATPI for, for being our title sponsors. Check us out on all the social medias. We'll follow at the end. Thanks for watching. Until next time, take care. ATPI. Delivering what really matters.